Hey guys, Joe Fye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Got some spare time on my hands. Everything is running smoothly here, so I figured I'm going to squeak in another model. This is the PM Research milling machine. Figured I'd stay with the metal sections of the miniature shop before I move on to the table saw and the wood lathe, but this thing looks like just too much fun. Fake door, guys. That's not going to work for me. Uh-uh. Nope. That will be a real door by the time I'm done. Promise. I really get carried away. I might make shelves inside and tools on them shelves to boot. <laughs> Who knows? I might lose my mind between now and then, too. We'll see. Nice set of castings they provide you. Give you all the raw material to do it. Let's take a look at the picture and see what it's supposed to look like. One twelfth scale kit. This is an 1800s model milling machine, and you can see there's an awful lot of parts there. Probably going to be very familiar to the shaper build as far as all the lead screws and the bevel nuts. And you've seen these before. There's one on the drill press. There's one on the shaper. But just because I want to have some fun starting off and get back into this, I'm going to start with the base first. So let's grab the base out of the kit, get over to the bench, take a closer look under a brighter light. Part number one, number one, off we go. Just like any other casting, the first thing I'm going to do is make all these lines go away. Make it look like a finished casting, of course. Figure out what's important, what's not important. If it's going to be machined at a later date, don't kill yourself trying to make it look beautiful now. What's the point? After machining, I would like to see an even thickness base here, all the way around. Of course, not in the center, because it's going it's, the crown is going to stay there. But I will cut the bottom off, hopefully end up with nice even corners. Tap some holes in there, and then you can strap it down to a plate, use those holes, whatever. And with the setup done correctly, you can probably access several of these surfaces all at one time. That is yet to be seen. I know I'm going to put it in a slave vise banking on the two sides now this is tapered so if you bank it on one side or the other you better have some options up your sleeve and I do the double vice setup is going to work really well and this is just killing me this door it absolutely killing me it would probably be a whole lot easier for me right now if I just made it go away but I think that'll be a video all unto itself make the door go away hollow it out replace it with a real door maybe a shelf or two on the inside who knows? We'll see how much time I have and how much patience I have by the time I get there. I say it's possible. Okay, let's squeeze this thing in a second vise. Actually, no. Let's take a file to some of these surfaces, clean it up, come back and show you what it looks like when that's done. Step one. I won't be using any power tools to finish off the castings in this particular kit. I'm going to do it all with these little jeweler files. And when I store these jeweler files, I don't know if I've shown this to you guys or not before, an end mill container, a reamer container, whatever, makes a fantastic little transport vessel for small jeweler files. And I keep them separated, flat, square, square profile, triangular, and round. Round surface, curved surface, fully round, half round, whatever. So the round ones have a little black band around it. That's how I know what tube to grab. And this one does not. So that works out really well. Up here in my ta -da, up here in my riser between my toolboxes I have a sharp file section right here this is a coarse medium and short fine round assorted heavier cut files and the handles are here this is my dedicated handle for the needle files try not to ever use a file without a handle guys it's just really not a good idea I know I'm preaching to the choir but you know, I gotta say it Put something on the end of that file so that file doesn't go through your hand. One of the things that you can use, these are cabinet pulls available at the local hardware store, buck a piece, give or take, and they got the hole pre-drilled in them for the cabinet hardware. Just file back, excuse me, grind back, belt sand back the tang of the file until it wedges in there nice and tight, and you're going to have yourself a good time. So that's a good, good way to protect yourself. If they crack, if you ever crack a wooden file handle, throw it away because it's only a matter of time until the file comes all the way through the handle. All right, 
let's get a hold of this guy right here. File off all the lines around the bosses. Top of the base. That door's just killing me. I can't even look at it. I actually dreamt about that last night. Uh, file off anything that looks like it's not going to get machined off. And hopefully next time you see this, it's going to look a little different. I will probably do the majority of this with a flat file with a safe face and a sharp edge so that I can get the areas around the bosses here. Uh, a flat file to do the, the ribs, the backbone I will call that. And probably an oval shaped file to do all the fillet and radius work. Let's do it. All right, after a couple of hours of filing away, I think I got all the flash lines off. I am going to machine the base complete. I'm going to go all the way around so these edges out here really don't matter. This gets machined, these faces inside and outside, they get faced off. This gets decked and drilled. So I think I got everything that needs to be got. Let's set this thing up in the dual vice setup. Start off by decking the bottom off and we'll figure out where we go from there. What's an important datum, what's not, get it established vertically this way. And uh, here we go. Okay, banking on the surfaces indicated, this is the setup that I've come up with. Now it doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be functional. <laughs> well, I can tell you that it qualifies for both of those because it is certainly not pretty but it will be functional now holding a part like this you can see that the base is skewed this way well that's not a big deal because when I put this in a second vise I can just cock this vise and do whatever I want to straighten that base out same thing with the alignment vertically this way I can just simply change this once it, once it goes in the vise and I have it true to the world. If it is still out, I can take the second vise and then rotate the second vise for perfect three axis alignment. That should work like a charm. Got a little piece of slave aluminum in there that I hollowed out the center in, in case there's any crown to this part, which there was. Another piece of sacrificial aluminum on the fake door that's on this casting. And I gotta tell you, that's, it's going to eat away at me, that fake door, man. I think that might be a real door by the time I'm done with it. And I have my hip ball as my, well, for lack of a better term, crazy ball. little plug to my friend Chuck up there at Outside Screwball. He used to sell those. I don't know if he still does. But if he does, check him out. It is a sphere with a flat on one side. And I can tell you, as far as holding irregular shapes, you just can't beat something like that. If you don't have one, grab a ball bearing, sand a flat on it, put it in your toolbox, and remember it's there. It's great for applications like this. Let's take it over to the mill, plug it into a second vise using a couple of V blocks, or excuse me, a couple of one, two, three blocks. I will hold it this way and use the one, two, three blocks against this surface and give it a squeeze you can't hold it that way without hitting the part. Let's do it. Now when I start to dust cut the top of this, or actually this is the bottom of the part, when I start to dust cut this, I'm looking for the cut to expand and end up with equal thickness ribs on either side of this base. Now to control that, you can just simply cock the vise in the vise, and away you go. Same thing for the front to rear. If the cut is more biased to the front than it is to the rear, unloosen that nut right there and cock the part rotate the part this way and if there is any need for side milling or any orientation of the base this way once again the main vise here pivot around one of the bolts unloosen both of them of course and shift the entire setup rotationally to give you the y-axis alignment that you're looking for so there you go Let's take a very superficial cut on that. Maybe lay an indicator on a tool bit. I'm not going to indicate a cast surface. I've never been a fan of that. So I'm going to lay something on here that I can trust. I'll indicate that just to get a rough view. 
and then maybe something across the front so I can tell basically where I'm at. Start tight, end right, guys. So let's get to it. With the part placed in the machine in the previous setup, first thing I'm going to do is establish the tilt of the part this way on the y-axis. I want that to be flat. And in order for that to be flat, I have to indicate across the top of a tool. But if a tool is on an incline, which it is, and it's not straight, one end of the tool is going to be higher than the other end. So the first thing you need to do is establish this true to the y-axis. Not butched around with it a little bit off camera, so there you go. It's about six tenths over three inches. That is close enough for what this is. Now the top. Close enough for what it is. <laughs> close enough for, it could be anything and it would be close enough. It's only about five tenths out in both directions. So with that being said, I'm going to take and relocate the one, two, three block that I'm using to hold the vise in place. This one right here. I'm going to stand it vertically and I'm going to bank on one of the surfaces on the actual casting. That will establish my y-axis rotation this way. And I can start to cut the bottom, see how it cleans up, tweak it from there. One of these blocks is going to be used to square against this front surface, this vertical surface right here. And the other one is going to squeeze the vise in the vise. So I'm just going to slide this along the bottom of the vise and bump that surface and look for a little bit of play. I'm going to move the entire setup along the y-axis axis until that is vertical, ever so gently. No wiggle in the block. It doesn't kick out like this or up like this when I make contact. It stays nice and true. I'm very pleased with that. This 104 and this 100 is 1 inch 104, 1 inch 100. So there is a 2,000 difference per side. But 1,000 over, uh, I guess that's about 2 and a half, 3 inches. That is more than acceptable. I have a feeling I'm going to tweak it anyway. Let's get a cutter run around this thing and see what kind of footprint we leave on the bottom of this part. And that will give us a pretty good idea of exactly what we're looking at. I am going to start with a small cutter for the initial op, but I will probably definitely put a fly cutter across this to make a nice even finish. I'm going to run across here. I'm going to look for the cutter to run out equally on both sides. That'll let me know whether or not I'm rotated fine this way. And I'm looking for an even cut this way, and that will let me know if I'm going uphill or downhill. So let's take a look. With that particular cut being almost exactly the same size, I feel pretty good about what I'm looking at. This one is a little bit bigger than that one width-wise, so that would indicate that this edge here is probably high. Does that make sense? If this edge is high, it's going to take more off. When it takes more off, it's going to get wider. So it could be an isolated event. Who knows? Let's go a little bit deeper and see how it starts cleaning up the center. If the sides of this cut are tapered, condition that I just stated will hold true.
still a little unsure about the footprint that it's leaving. You can see how this is dished on this side. That would indicate that the surface is concave. It's bowed in. So as it traverses the material, it's cutting here, it's not cutting here, and it is cutting here. So <laughs> I'm just going to keep going until I clean up a little bit more, get a little bit better feel for what I'm looking at. But I think you can see that the front is a little bit wider than the back in the cleanup. So I may have to kick this thing back just a hair. We'll see. Let's pause for a second and take a look at the track that the smaller cutter is giving us. These cuts in the front and rear are done at the same depth, but you can see that the cut in the rear is thinner than the cut in the front. That would indicate that the front is a little bit higher. But being that this is a casting, there's no way to be sure that we're not just looking at some type of casting discrepancy. Let me kill this light for a second. Nope, put that one back on. There you go. Side to side, the cut is running out a little bit closer to this side than it is to this side. So that might mean that the part is a little bit cocked this way. I'm going to take the cutter and I'm going to run the cutter down the edge. I'm not going to clean up the edge because the edge is going to tell us a lot about what's going on with the alignment of this part. But I have to say just by looking at it that the back has to come up. And if I was really splitting hairs, the part would have to rotate a little bit this way. Okay, this side's got to go down, this end's got to come up. Let's run a couple of test cuts on that and see if that holds true. And not for nothing guys, but there are 99 different ways to do a part like this depending on what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to demonstrate. Ideally, if my end goal was to have parallel sides front to rear, which is basically what I'm going after, then you should bank on those surfaces and everything else wouldn't mean a thing. But if you banked on those surfaces, you couldn't trust the vertical uh, relationship to the other features. So pick your poison, right? You definitely can bank on that if you have jaws that are tall enough because you're going to need that. This is a lot taller than a standard Kurt vice jaw. But for what I'm doing, the setup that I'm demonstrating here is just a setup used to correct taper and draft in irregular shaped objects okay that's why i chose this method let's move on This side is a very even cut front to rear. It's, it's a very solid width, very nice width. This one, on the other hand, who knows? Maybe the mold was cold as it was coming out of the shot. And this side, this corner here is low, but you can see it wants to clean up here the same way it cleaned up over here. I'm just going to roll with it. I'm going to stick with what I got, trust my numbers. And let's finish this surface.
getting a little ahead of myself I want to do the perimeter before I do the fly cut since I already have the smaller tool in I'm going to climb cut the entire perimeter take off a minimal amount I'll probably blend the corners in by hand Now that I have one side and one side complete, I'm going to zero my digital out and whatever the reading is on this side, I will make sure that I hit the center line function so that I can find the center of the base and put the four corner holes in. Why not? When I have a surface, a smaller surface like this that I'm looking to have uh, an exceptional cosmetic finish on when I'm done, I will use a fly cutter and I will set my fly cutter so that the cutting point is farther out than the widest section of the part. That way when I sweep across the part and the fly cutter is directly over the center of the part, the cut is complete and I do not have to continue the cut and worry about any backside drag, feathering, scraping, tearing, for additional time and that's also a very good tip for CNC if you can consume the entire part with the front half of the tool why bother using the back half that is not cutting anything and it's just wasted time so let's see how this looks Very smooth cut, nice and uniform, and you can see what I mean about getting the entire cut within the boundary of the spinning tool diameter. Gives a really super finish. That was a 2,000 steep pass, and I spun that by hand. It was done dry, high-speed tool bit, a very minimal, if non-existent, radius on the corner. Worked really well. As far as the presentation in this setup is concerned, this part is complete. Front and rear dusted, left and right dusted, top dusted, and the corners are tapped to 540 Imperial. Now this was done by eye, just wanted a nice spot on that. Normally these on a regular machine, these would be through holes, but these are tapped and I'm going to put studs in there and flange nuts on the other side when it's on display to make it look like it's screwed to something. And if I care to pass an actual cap screw through and secure this to the display base, I have that option. So without it being fastened down to anything, the threaded hole is the better option for aesthetics and appearance. Appearance that it's bolted down to something. All right, let's pop it out of here and take a look. Under normal circumstances for any follow-up secondary on a part like this, well, just leave it in the vise and flip the vise and now you have everything that's uh, true to the world. But remember, those are draft sides. You can see that the outside of the part is not true to the outside of the vise. It is parallel to this surface. So if you had simple machining to do on this plane, now would be the time to do it. You'd be assured that it would be true. 
but I believe I'm going to put this up against a fixture plate for future surface uh, operations on this and be able to rotate it and flip it. That's the reason that I established true surfaces here. Let's do a quickie little visual inspection of exactly how everything turned out. I'm using one, two, three blocks on a granite surface plate. And take a look at the gap between the casting and the edge of the block. I would say that's pretty good. Good enough for rough casting. I think we got a good place to start. You... Alright, before I go any further, I would like to say I have a nice flat surface here and two parallel and square edges here so I can put this back in the vise and hold it a variety of different ways. Before I go down that road, I'm going to try to figure out what datums are important here, what features are important, what gets cut, what doesn't get cut. And I have to say that this little guy down here, believe it or not, as insignificant as it may look, is going to play a big role in where everything ends up. I want the elevation screw that goes in there at the end to end up clean, positioned basically on the center of this top radius. And that top radius will be the distance from the outside to the center line. So there's reference datum number one. Naturally, reference datum number two is going to be the center line of the part. So I think with those two features, with those two datums, you're going to be able to find out where this is. On the print, there's a gap between the inside of the casting here and up here. I do not want to see this entire nub go away, because if that goes away, then there's an undercut. Or in the medical community, we call that notching the femur, and you just don't want to do that. So I'd like to see symmetrical features front and rear here. That would be nice. There is a height called out from these, a finished height from these guys here, planed off, milled off square to everything else, to this face right here. And basically nothing else matters. I am not going to do any dovetail work on this part at this time because it's easier to use the small finished component as a functional gauge while I'm doing that. So with that in mind, I will finish those two pieces, the one that goes here and here. Finish those first and use them as gauges for this work. Makes perfect sense, right? Let's pop it back in the machine, take a dust cut off of this, clean this surface up. Maybe at the same time that this is centered, I'll establish some indication rails out here that will ultimately be milled away as dovetails during the final operation. And uh, put it on the side after that. Maybe drill a few holes. <laughs> 